The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, speak today. And thank you so much for uh, joining in. So before we begin the talk, Let's just take a moment to arrive in the place wherever you are, whatever you were doing earlier. So now it's time to put that all aside and just focus on the present moment and just arrive in this time and place, whatever that means to you. You might want to take a few long breaths. Or you might want to just come into contact with your body. Just to arrive in the moment. So we can fully focus for the next hour or so on the talk. So today I want to talk a bit about the state of the world, the affairs in the world. But before we do that, just please take a moment now you've arrived here in this place, ready for the talk. Also take a moment to reflect on how you feel now. You don't have to give it a name, but just check in with yourself. How do you feel? Just generally, you feel okay, or maybe you're upset or whatever, just, just notice how you feel, how your body is, how your mind is. Always a good thing to check in with yourself. So as I said, I wanted to talk a bit about the state of the world. The world right now is in such a bad place, don't you think? There is all the wars going on and there is COVID and the climate is not doing well. People are blaming each other. People are arguing and fighting and it really makes me sad to see the world as it is now. I don't know who are listening from over which part of the world but we have the lockdown now in melbourne it's the worst covid in australia since the start oh 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 the world where is it going how do you feel if i talk to you like that about how bad the world is just check in with yourself how do you feel now after listening to somebody complaining about the world. If I, I, I had to sort of pretend, because it's actually I don't feel like that, but even if I pretend, I feel a bit worse about the world. But you can also look at the world differently instead of thinking, about all the bad things that are happening. How about I talk about the world like this? This morning I woke up, I said, and early, and I woke up in a monastery where people built this nice hut for me to live in. It gives me such a beautiful opportunity to live in that hut 
and spend my life as a monk meditating and uh, studying the suttas and then i looked outside it was late, a little bit later when it was light and it was such a nice day the sun was shining and the grass is green and it's so much beauty i saw outside and there is also so many beautiful things going on in the world people are doing so much charity work like for example people running the buddhist society of western australia and people doing uh, charity work for poor people or, or people working in hospitals people teachers nurses doctors and there are so many people really doing a the best they can to uh, make this world more beautiful place and if i think about the world like that it suddenly becomes so much so much more beautiful and i know that if in an hour or so i go for lunch then there will be food there for me wow I don't go hungry today. What a blessing is that there are people in the world who cannot say that they will today be hungry. And that is, of course, is a bad thing, but there's also good things in the world. So as Buddhists, we should always make sure we take the both our, our aspects into account we know there is suffering in the world but we also need to remember the good things because if we only focus on the suffering if we only think ah oh, it's locked down and there's wars and if you get too much into the news and that stuff then you get very easily depressed and you feel bad and you feel sad and you don't feel like life is really worth living. But focus then also on the good. Because the, the Buddha said, for example, reflect on the generosity of people and your own generosity as well. As I said before, people do so much charity work. And the food that I get later is also offered to me people bring that uh through uh, catering now because of the lockdown but they bring that uh, and i don't have to uh, have to pay for that at all it is totally for free and i'm sure you have all other things in your life that are on the beautiful side so while as buddhists we don't ignore the bad things in, in life we have to always make sure that we are happy enough and that we are positive enough to be able to deal with the bad things in life and this is done by uh, focusing on the good things in life as well from time to time and this can be very small things it, just small things to lift up your mind for example this morning i was having a little little cup of coffee and i had the funniest cup <laughs> and i got it here it's now it's with water but <laughs> have a look <laughs> it just i just thought it was funny in the car view and on the side feel free to waste my time <laughs> just small things like that small things in life it can make a difference I mean, Garfield is a bit, does, it sounds a bit, looks a bit silly, maybe, but it's, it's uplifting. If you look at the funny side of life, then you don't get dragged down by all the suffering that is also part of life. You've got a basis to work from. 
and the Buddha uh, kept talking about these kind of things for time and time again in the suttas. He talks a lot about uh, the pains of life, about sickness, about dying. This is rea a reality. This is something we should not ignore. But the Buddha talked also a lot, a lot about happiness and about creating a bright attitude, a happy mind, and even just reflecting on the Buddha makes me happy already. Now the Buddha gave different types of reflections that we can do to create this sense of stability and happiness inside of us. He, he said, well, some of the reflections we did in the chanting earlier, the, the reflections on the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, for those of you who are Buddhists, those can be of tremendous value. Don't just chant those uh, for the sake of the chanting, but really reflect, oh, wow, we have the Buddha's teachings available to us in this life. Isn't that amazing? I mean, especially nowadays with the with this all this technology uh, stuff that I don't even know exactly how it all works, but uh, you you apparently you can all see this on on the YouTube and maybe other places as well. You can see it live or later. Isn't that amazing that this is possible today? Um, the, for the last two and a half thousand years since the Buddha, people would have given an arm or a leg to be able to uh, see all these Dhamma talks by monks and nuns and also lay people as well. They would, to be able to just sit from their home be in their home and click a few buttons and then they could see the talk. That, that, that would be unimaginable. So we are so fortunate actually today to live in this day and age that we are able to share teachings like this. And we are able also to read the word of the Buddha uh, so easily nowadays. There are so many translations available. The, they are available also on the internet. It's not just that only the monks and the nuns uh, have the suttas. We all have the uh, access to it. And things like these is something I often reflect upon, not just the suttas themselves, but also just how, how fortunate am I to be able to, to read these texts because there's so much wisdom in them that just uplifts the mind. And it makes you, as I said before, the happy mind is more able to deal with the problematic things in the world. It's not only a good thing to develop a happy mind to, uh, to be able to deal with the suffering in the world, but also sometimes I see people, they take on too much of the suffering in the world. They take it all on their own shoulders. I see people suffering from COVID who do not even have COVID. Do you know what I mean? You probably see those people around you as well. They are all the time worried, checking the news, etc. So they're suffering from COVID, but they don't even have the COVID. <laughs> In a way, it's suffering mentally is worse than if you would have the physical COVID. Yeah, it's in the mind is always the worst of the pain because you, that is inside of you. It, it comes so close to you. If just the body is sick, oh well, the mind uh, can still be happy. But if the mind is sick, yeah, if the mind gets touched by COVID, then you are really in trouble because then definitely the body will also just be dragged along into, uh, into pain and sickness. So 
keep the mind separate from COVID. Don't just keep it happy and bright by reflecting on things like uh, the Dhamma and just the, 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 the beautiful things in life, but also separate the mind in a sense from, from the suffering. Let it, you can look over the suffering with the mind, you can observe it, but don't get mashed into it too, too much. Have a, have a, have a, have a perspective that is true, that aligns with the truth. And th this is one of my favorite things that ever happened in my life. And it happened so often and it happened again and again. And this is, was my father, my father on his bicycle. I will tell you the, how my life as a young boy was, uh, as a young boy living in the Netherlands with my mother and brother. Uh, I used to have two brothers, but uh, one of them passed away. So most of my life, I had only one brother and we would sit around the dinner table, me, my brother and my mother, in the during the weekdays of waiting for my father to uh, come back from work uh, my father always goes to work by bicycle it's like 20 kilometers one way and 20 kilometers back you know it's the netherlands so you use a bicycle i don't know if you've ever been there but people they bicycle well my dad is a bit more enthusiastic than the average dutch man but uh yeah he does that every day, cycle 20 kilometers one way back. He still does that every day. Uh, and he also did it while it's raining. Even when it's raining, he would go on his bicycle. And then me, my mother and my brother would be waiting around the dinner table for him to arrive from work. And outside, the rain was crashing up. Ah. Oh. And I felt so sorry for my poor father who had to bicycle to go on his bike all the way through the rain. Oh, why? I thought, so this poor man is all going to be wet. All the rain is going to fall on his head. And then he, come, he comes home and this happened so often. And I, I asked him, oh, are you so wet? Is it not uh, too windy? Uh, how are you? And then he said, Oh, you know, most of it misses talking about the rain. Most of it misses. <laughs> most of the rain doesn't hit you. Most of the rain falls somewhere else. Yeah, it's only a tiny bit, a little bit of rain that falls on your head. But when we are walking in the rain, it usually doesn't feel like that. It feels like all the rain. <laughs> In the whole world, all falls on us. <laughs> Isn't that right? That's what it usually feels like to me anyway. I never think about the rain that falls somewhere else. I'm only considered concerned about the rain that falls on me. But my dad had this really, really wise and lovely attitude to not only rain, but to life in general, that most of it falls somewhere else. And it's the same with the suffering in the world. Most of it happened somewhere else. So now with COVID, if you don't have COVID, most of it misses, but still you think it feels sometimes like all the suffering in the world, in a way you take it upon your shoulders because you can't distance yourself from it. You get so enmeshed with the situations out there in the world. So this is my advice to you to take some distance uh, away from that, from, from the, the uh, hard things in life in a sense, I mean a distance in, in a mental way, like my father sort of, he couldn't get out of the rain. And I'm not saying you should run away uh, to some kind of uh, 
private island or something <laughs> i'm saying you should think about things differently sometime my father driving in the rain still got just as wet <laughs> but he was still happy in the end and uh, because he didn't complain about all the rain that was falling on him he also considered all the rain that misses and this is the way i often think about life when i uh, for example don't feel so well i'm a bit sick or something and I, it seems like all all my sickness is all that matters to me in life but there's always a wider perspective as well to take into account so as buddhists we want to and also everybody i suppose wants to travel through life skillfully and we don't want to get uh, we don't want to suffer more than we need to and what sort of i suppose what i'm trying to get at in this talk is telling you that most of the suffering that you experience is you bring upon yourself in a way it's optional you could say because it just depends on your perspective on life you can look at the same situation from different angles and your whole attitude changes my father could have looked at the rain like it was all falling on him or he could look at it like most of it misses and just that change of perspective changes the whole ball game it just changes your mindset there's this quote uh, from uh, from the, the, the shakespeare's play hamlet and it uh, and, and in this case, Hamlet is talking to some of his friends. I don't know the whole play. We, whole play. I think we had to do it for uh, English class once here in the Netherlands. Uh, but I remember this phrase. I don't remember myself, but there was this phrase. Um, Nothing is either good or bad in the world, but thinking makes it so. I will uh, rephrase it. Nothing is either 100% good or 100% bad. But if you look at it in one way or the other, then it becomes 100% bad sometimes. As, so nothing is either good or bad in the world, but thinking makes it so. It's our pers perspective on life that uh, makes that you could really say makes life different. Yeah, it's not just that it looks different, it really makes life different. The, the, this uh, quote of Shakespeare continues, I believe something like, uh, then, then Hamlet says, I feel Denmark, that's where he lived, Denmark is a prison, but to you it's not, to his friends. It was not a prison. His, his friends looked at Denmark differently. So right now you're in the COVID lockdown. I suppose th those of you who are listening from Melbourne. Is it like a prison to you? Or is it not like a prison to you? Hmm? What Hamlet was saying is it depends on how you look at it. Yeah? Thinking makes it so. You could look at the lockdown as lost opportunity to meet people, or you could look at it as an opportunity gained to be more, to spend more time with yourself. Maybe do a bit more reading or a bit more meditation or contemplation of your life. So lockdown can be a good thing as well, depending on how you look at it. In the news, of course, it's always portrayed as a bad thing that we best have over with as soon as possible. But maybe, maybe not just the lockdown, 
but the whole COVID situation, maybe it's also a good thing. Well, I'm not, maybe I'm convinced there's also good things because nothing is either 100% good or 100% bad. So what are some good things maybe that we could say from the COVID? Aside from the lockdown, it's good that people spend more time by themselves, but just the general situation of this COVID, I think that it teaches people something. Somewhere deep inside people, I hope, now realize that we cannot control nature. That we are actually quite small as a human, human, uh, human race. We are quite weak. But we are also all in this together. The COVID doesn't discriminate between male or female or being of color or being uh, not of color or doesn't discriminate between sexuality or between rich or poor or able or disabled. And the COVID just hits everybody. So hopefully people realize through this that we are all so similar and that we can stand together as the human race and face up to this crisis together. So in that sense, it's a nice opportunity. Yeah, it's like, what is this saying again? Like, uh, is there some sort of saying, I think it's in Dutch, like if you have a shared enemy, then you come together as, as allies, <laughs> something like that. I can't remember exactly. But the, the point is that if COVID is our shared enemies, then all, all human beings should come together join forces in, in a sense and so i think this is an opportunity for us to come closer to one another and also learn more about the fragility of life why is it nice or, or good to know about the fragility of life it sounds wouldn't it be better if life was untouchable and uh, unable to be harmed? Ajahn Chah had a this is this is a has a picture here actually. Ajahn Chah is one of the uh, senior teachers of Buddhism. He's originally the teacher of my teacher. My teacher is Arjun Brahm. And Arjun Chah was his teacher. And he had a story about a cup. So Arjun Chah would hold up a cup and say, do you see the crack in this cup? Huh? Do you see a crack? Well, you might say, no, I don't see a crack. But then Arjun Chah would say, well, there is a crack already in there but you don't see it yet. It's very small, but one day you will drop the cup and it will break. Good cup. And because the cup is so fragile and breakable, you have to take care of it. You have to hold it uh, with attention and care. And I was a young boy, my mother, usually gave me plastic uh, glasses <laughs> probably all mothers do with their young young boys and young girls and young uh, young children they give them plastic glasses why well because you can be clumsy and you can just drop the cup and okay well this the, the drink pours out but at least the cup is still intact but then you grow a bit older and your mother or father or parent gives you a glass cup for the first time and what do they say be careful with this cup because it is breakable it is fragile and it's the same thing with life exactly because it's fragile that's why we should care for it and that's why we should uh, 
pay attention to each other's needs and that's why we that's why there is kindness and compassion because life is fragile so that is what COVID can teach us more compassion COVID is what <laughs> as I'm talking about it it seems more and more wonderful <laughs> every minute now <laughs> do, do you see what I mean it's just thinking makes it so the way you look at things really changes changes the whole ball game what else can we learn from COVID now and now I'm on about it I might as well see you is there more nice things about COVID well this is a, maybe a bit more of my personal reflection but uh, I think uh, we can teach or we can learn from COVID that uh, the way we treat uh, animals is not uh, it comes back to us basically because we are we have learned from the the investigations that the COVID came from the animal uh, uh, people. Uh, how do they call them again? Wet shops or wet markets? I, I only read the news like once a month or something. So I, excuse me if I get the, these kind of details wrong. But like the wet sh the wet markets or something in in China where they have all these animals in cages. That's where the COVID started. Yeah. It's, uh, because people think they can uh, have the right to own animals. And I think we can learn from this, that this is maybe not uh, a good way to uh, go about uh, life as human beings. Again, it comes back to compassion also. It's not just compassion to human beings, it's compassion to everybody, including also animals. And you might think that like China is a faraway place, but yeah, it, it also in Australia, we don't treat animals well, just as bad, if not worse. So we, again, now, you, now I'm starting to focus on the bad things in life, but we can learn from the COVID, I think. It's, as I said, it's more my uh, personal reflection uh, that uh, we should uh, learn from this as well in this sense that uh, yeah, we should, should, should take a bit more care about uh, about these kind of things, about the animals as well. That's what we can learn from anyway. Uh, so attitude to life. This is what changes things. So what kind of attitude do you want to have? Do you want to have uh, a good attitude or a bad attitude. There's a story of the little girl who used to cook with her mother every day. And the mother once saw the little girl being quite upset about some things that happened in the world. Then the mother took the girl aside and she put three pots on the stove, three pots to cook, and I put water in each of them. And in one pot, she put a potato. In the second pot, she put an egg. And in the third pot, she put coffee beans. And she put them all to a boil together with her girl. And when all of them were cooked, she showed the girl first the potato. It got really soft and oh, it was overcooked and very weak. Then she showed the egg. And the egg was really hard, also overcooked. and. Yeah, you couldn't eat anymore so hard. But then she showed the water with the coffee beans. And the coffee beans made the whole water nice, smell nice and taste nice, if you like coffee, that is. But uh, generally, people like coffee, so it smells good and tastes good. The coffee beans changed the whole water. And then the mother said to the little girl, 
What do you want to be in life? Do you want to be a potato, an egg, or a coffee bean? If you're a potato in life, then if things happen around you, if like the water boils the egg or the potato, if bad things happen outside and you get hard, no, I get angry, I don't want this, the people are bad, it shouldn't be like that. Ah, oh, the world is so... Mm. Then you are... Oh, that's when you are an egg, sorry, because then you get hard. Yeah, you get tough. Yeah? But you, if you are a potato, then you get, oh, soft and oh, oh, and you're so hard. Oh, the world, oh, I feel so bad. But if you, you can also be the coffee bean. And if you are the coffee bean, then the water boils around you, the world around you. Uh, you like the water, but you, your reaction is it to not to get hard or soft, but to spread into the world, as it were, a good aroma, like the coffee bean, you spread the good, the good vibes, they say, of kindness, compassion, generosity, all these things I have been uh, touching upon. Yeah. So you have an you have a choice. You always in life you have a choice. As Buddhists, we talk about karma. Yeah, we talk about karma. Usually, people when they use the word, they think about karma as something in the past that happened that they did, now they get the results. They say, ah, oh, COVID is the result of my karma or whatever. But karma is more about what you do now and how that is going to affect the future because whatever happened in the past, it's already gone. You can't change it anymore. So there's nothing uh, pragmatic about teachings. I think about karma in that way that only the past influences the present. It's more pragmatic to think about it in the sense of what you do now. Uh, influences what is going to uh, happen in the past, how you feel in the in, or feel in the future. I was going with this. Come on. I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever given a talk to nobody. I just see uh, myself on the screen. I'm giving a talk to myself. Uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Anyway, so I lost my train of thought there and there's nobody to prompt me where I was. So I'm just gonna start on something totally different. Uh, well, meditation, meditation. Whenever I uh, need to refocus my thoughts or um, find some stability in life, I got back to meditation. So now I lost my thoughts in his talk. Let's get back to meditation in the talk. Because the intrinsic part of Buddhism is to at some point in your practice, do a bit of meditation. I highly recommend that for uh, everybody to try a bit of meditation. And in meditation also, many of these concepts that I've been talking about apply as well. Thinking makes it so. The way you look at meditation changes the meditation. Let's say you start out meditating, you put your cushion ready. I have a cushion here. You put your cushion and you go, ah, oh, meditation again. I have to sit here for half an hour. Oh, well, this is gonna be bad. Here we go. Breathing in, breathing out, blah. Yeah, then your meditation is going to suck. <laughs> I can tell you that, and uh, I exaggerating it. So you are like, yeah, 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 yeah. Soon you, of course, of course. But in small ways, you do this when you meditate. In small ways, you sit down. I'm not a good meditator. 
this is going to be not easy. No, meditation again. Yeah. But change it around. Yeah. Look at things from the different perspective. Oh, meditation. Yeah, you can meditate today. And I can just nice and sit and don't have to do anything and just see what happens. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good chance to get peace. Hmm. It's a good chance also to think about all the good things that I did in life. And all the good things happen in the world. The Buddha taught meditation like this. He did. I'm not just making these things up to make you feel good. It's because it's core, core Buddhism to uh, meditate like that, to uh, reflect upon your virtues and the virtues of others, to reflect upon things that make you happy. There's suttas where the Buddha talks about uh, people meditating and they do uh, satipatthana. That's what, the, that's what the Buddha is talking about. Some of you might know. There is all different concepts of what Satipatthana may or may not be, but let's just say they were meditating, those people. And then the monk said, or the Buddha said, they got distracted and dull and they didn't feel happy. What was the Buddha's advice? Just continue on with that attitude? No. He said, okay, you're not getting happy and peaceful and calm and you're just feeling worse than before, then try this. Bring up something inspiring in your mind. That's what he said. Bring up something that brightens the mind. Bring up a sense of joy and delight. Whatever creates joy in your mind is a good thing. He gave some examples, but you don't have to be limited to uh, the Buddha's examples. Yeah. You have your own life where, there have, where you have joyful things to reflect upon. My life as a monk is totally different. So when I reflect upon being so fortunate this morning to wake up in a hut that somebody gave me to well, it's not even mine, but I care to stay in. They let me stay in. Then for me, that is a different reflection than you can't do the same reflection. So you have to make your own, uh, make your own reflections on life. Maybe you are so fortunate to have the partner that you do. Man, you can reflect. I am so fortunate to be able to have the, have the opportunity to, to listen to talks by uh, the monks, nuns, and etc. You can reflect, I'm so fortunate uh, to have this or that parent or this or that job or this or that whatever. Yeah, you can say, I'm so fortunate to live in Australia where there's a good healthcare system, people are not generally not poor, etc. Yeah. This is what the Buddha said. Bring up a sense or bring up something that uh, inspires you, that makes you happy. Then you just think about that for a moment in your meditation or not for a moment, for, for just can take quite a, some time. Just reflect upon it in different ways and create happiness inside of you. I can be like, oh, yeah. So, so amazing that I'm going to be given a, a lunch today. Uh, I'll, I'll have to see, maybe there is no lunch, <laughs> but uh, so far in my whole monastic life, I've never uh, not had lunch. So that is, is, isn't that fantastic? This makes me so happy. And these kind of reflections are 
that make you happy are also part of meditation is what I'm saying. Meditation is not only about stopping the thinking and uh, focusing on your breath or whatever. It's also these kind of things, these kind of reflections. And to me, these have al always been very important in uh, my life as a monk to, to reflect upon things in a positive way. And this is something that some, some meditation uh, uh, methods don't emphasize or I don't mention at all. So I just want to put, point, put that out there. But don't forget these kind of things because this the joy that we create is the basis of the meditation, really. If you want to have a quiet mind, as the Buddha said in the Sutta so many times, you first have to have a joyful mind. Because if the mind is not joyful and happy, then it won't stay still. Yeah, It's the same with the body. If the body is aching and tiring, then yeah, you have to keep moving around to keep it comfortable. Yeah? Or at least to get some sort of comfort. But if the body is nice and peaceful, it feels good and it's easy to sit still and in the mind exactly like that if it's joyful and happy then it's easy to have a quiet and still mind if the mind is uh, is is uh, pessimistic not happy not bright then it's impossible for it to stay still. And it's also impossible for it to stay with the breath, for example, if that is how you meditate. So create the happiness first. Attitude. That's what matters. In meditation and in life, attitude is key as another quotation that I now comes to mind if you change the way you look at things the thing you look at changes this is especially true in meditation if you change the way you look at your meditation the whole meditation changes if you are doing breath meditation and you are like, oh, here's my breath again, in, out. No, that meditation won't be good. If you're doing breath meditation and you're like, ah, oh, in, nice, out, nice. Then the meditation will be much more joyful. Yeah? So the way you look at it, that is gonna change the thing. And in the end, taking things even further to wisdom. In, in Buddhism, we have these three stages of practice. It's like sila samadhi panya, it's like the virtue and then the meditation. And then there's the wisdom is built on top of those two. Wisdom is also changing perspective. That is really what it's all about. Buddhism in the end. The Buddha was essentially saying, you're not, you're not seeing life correctly. So it also comes down to changing our perspectives. The funny thing is, the Buddha's perspective was, you're not seeing suffering correctly. How? One thing is, you're taking suffering Personally, you see at it in terms of my suffering. All, all everything happens to me. Buddha says this sense of me or mine is an illusion. So even on the deeper level, and I don't have much time to talk about that now, even on the deeper level, it all comes down to perspective in a sense. 
the way we look at things. So I hope to have encouraged you to try and look at life in a different way, in a, in a more optimistic way. I'm not saying you have to see everything as positive, yeah? There's also negative things in life, we should not neglect them. But don't get dragged down in the neg negative things. Always see also in everything the good side. See the good side in situations like COVID. See the good side in people as well. All, even, even that you might say the worst of people still have good sides as well. See the good sides of meditation. See the good sides of life. And with that attitude, it's like most of the rain misses. You will be so much more easygoing through life. And you will be like my father who said, most of the rain falls somewhere else. It's only a little bit. And he came in the evening, if he had to cycle through the rain and he came home, he was always happy and never complaining about the rain. And that's what I hope to bring to you also to have that attitude to life. And I hope that it is helpful for you. These are just my own personal reflections. So whatever uh, of this talk you don't uh, feel useful for you, feel free to disregard. Uh, yeah, but take along whatever you can use. And I hope that is helpful to you. And I think that we can now do some questions. I don't know how long we are going still. Thank you very much, Bante. We have, uh, we've just gone past 10 o'clock, so we have about maybe 25 minutes to answer some questions. Excellent. And we okay. have some questions in the, in, the, in the live chat already, but first I want to say thank you so much, Bante, for the wonderful talk and for sharing your thoughts and the, the wisdom of the Buddha, and also your father's wonderful wisdom as well. I think we have a, a title for the talk now, Most of the Rain Misses. Yeah, let's do that. I think my father will love that if I send it to him later. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the questions now, Bante. Um, there are some relate more directly to the talk. The first question, though, is a bit more uh, abstract, perhaps. Um, the question is, Thich Nhat Hanh, speaking on emptiness, asks, empty of what? Uh, answering, empty of a separate self. Nothing and no one is alone or separate. Would this be your understanding of emptiness? I don't know enough details of Thich Nhat Hanh's view to say that I align with it or not. I actually did practice in Thich Nhat Hanh tradition when I was a lay person uh, in a lay group of, of uh, young people, but I never got too much into uh, the doctrinal ideas of that tradition and just generally did the practice with them. So I'm not going to say yes or no to that, but I'll just give my own uh, reflections upon it that when we ask emptiness yes i agree we have to ask ourselves empty of what the buddha talked about emptiness but he did indeed talk about emptiness not just empty of everything when he talked about emptiness he did mean empty of a, of a self inside of us when we talk about emptiness, it can often sound like uh, uh, like uh, nothingness. And sometimes that's what it means. But usually when the Buddha talks about it, that means just empty of ego. Let's put it like that. Empty of ego. Selfless. And you're empty of ego, you still have room for compassion and kindness 
and for generosity and all these good mind states. You should not be empty of that. There are people who I, uh, I feel a bit sorry for them, but sometimes people have the idea that the, uh, that the Buddhist practice is just to empty your minds of, of everything. It, it does relate actually to, the ta- to what I was talking about, because I said it, that is not the point uh, of Buddhism is to just empty your mind. You also have to fill it up with good things. So you, you empty out the bad things, you put it in the good things, you put in the compassion. You put in the uh, kindness. And then you take out the sense of self, the egoism. That's what you should be empty of. And in a way, the two go together because the less sense of self you have, the more uh, open you become to other people, the more you feel the, the, the connection to other people. Yeah. So uh, I do very much... Uh, agree at least on the surface with those uh, thoughts that you have shared there in the question. As I said, I don't have enough detail to, to say I think that Hannah had a 100% right or not, but uh, on the surface, there is a lot in there anyway that you can take home. And often it's, it's in this way that you should use teachings of various teachers. Sometimes you hear one teacher say uh, A and another teacher say B, and on the surface they seem to contradict on the level on the intellect they might contradict but if you look at the teaching not about finding out what's right or wrong but look about what is useful and what is unuseful what is skillful and what is not skillful the buddha talked about skillful and not skillful teachings so is this teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh, do you feel it is useful for you right now, where you are now? Does it create a more happiness in your life? If so, then take it on board, at least on that level of usefulness. Take it on board as a pragmatic teaching. Uh, if it, you don't find it useful, then don't take it on board. That's why I also said at the end of my talk, uh, if anything here you don't find it inspiring or useful, then uh, yeah, don't, uh, then you don't have to uh, use those thoughts. You, you just disregard that part of the talk and just use whatever parts you did find useful. So often I reflect upon uh, teachings like that. Uh, is it useful or not? Instead of is it true or not? There's also a place for truth. We ju- should not think that Buddhism is only about being pragmatic uh, and that there is no statements that are true and false, but there's different levels. And sometimes we get a bit too stuck too much. I see this in myself anyway. Sometimes we get a bit too stuck about truth versus false instead of useful versus unuseful. The things are slightly different. So. I actually saw a talk by Tignat Han once, and uh, he did not touch upon this subject, but uh, was it, we had a whole day with, with Tignat Han, actually, uh, with his tradition, and the monks came over, and the nuns came over, and uh, it's really nice. So that was a really useful day for me, I can still remember. It was really inspiring. We went to the beach uh, uh, with the practice group, uh, not with Thich Nhat Hanh, but uh, we just meditated on the beach and uh, yeah, it was a lovely day. And people afterwards asked me what was the best day, part of the day? And then I said, ah, oh, the meditation. <laughs> Not Thich Nhat Hanh's talk, so that was also nice. And just the meditation was the best part for me because that's when you really apply the teachings. Yeah? Thich Nhat Hanh may say something that's right or wrong, but it only becomes alive when you apply it. So I apply in the meditation teaching and it makes me happy. Then that's where I feel Buddhism really comes to shine. So that's what, that's why that was the most important part of that day for me. Anyway, I'm going a bit of a tangent here, but uh, yeah, thank you for that question. It brings up a nice memories in, in me anyway. So hope that answers it uh, anyway. Yeah. 
Thank you, Bhante. Uh, there are two questions here which I probably relate to the same uh, thing. It's You said to um, see the good side, but there are two people who may be struggling to see the good side in other people. So one of the questions says, how do you deal with other people that are always stuck in a negative cycle, especially when they aren't open to communication? And another person is in a situation where they say they're being persecuted by bad police and they don't know how to deal with it. So um, maybe uh, could you respond to those two, that idea of someone uh, yeah, responding I, to someone like, yeah, in that situation? Yeah, I'm not sure about the uh, persecuted by police. That sounds pretty severe, persecuted by police. Um, so I can't really respond to that uh, without any more details. Uh, but uh, just how to look at other people if they are um, uh, negative. Is that the, the, was the first question, right? That's correct. Yes, someone who's stuck in a negative cycle and they aren't open to communication. Yeah. We can always... There's many ways to go about it, but do you, when you, you think of that, that person or those people, what, what do you see if they are stuck in that cycle? Do you see a happy and shiny person who goes through life with energy and courage? Who is generally happy and joyful? Or do you see a person who is sad and angry or maybe annoyed, just stuck in life, who is not really, not really happy with themselves or the world. Which of those two do you see? And I think, I'm pretty sure you see mostly that second person, the person who is not happy, who is suffering, who is stuck in their mind and in life. Reflect upon that, that person is suffering a lot inside of their mind. They're not, they don't want to be like that. They also want to be positive, happy. This is a natural, everybody wants to Deep inside, find happiness, peace, joy. Nobody wants to be negative, stuck in a loop, depressed. Let's say you would have the opportunity while you were still uh, in your mother's womb you would have the opportunity to to uh, check a box. The question is, what kind of person do you want to be? Box A, happy person. Box B, negative person. What box would you choose? <laughs> everybody would check box A. Everybody wants to be a happy person. Yeah. Where I'm going with this is, Compassion, compassion for that person who is struggling. They're, they're having a diff difficult time and you might not be able to pull them out of that. People can really, I've seen this also, can really be stuck in their own minds and the best of our intentions we cannot do we cannot get them out of that but we can still do things for them by being kind having compassion supporting them and in this way we at least provide the 
atmosphere of kindness and that gives them an opportunity if they see the kindness in us gives them an opportunity to also realize oh that is another way to go about life in a compassionate way kind way not a negative way the buddha talked about having good friends kalyana mitta why it's quite funny the buddha talked a lot about to the monks and the nuns he talked about a lot about going into solitude but he also talked a lot about having good friends people that are wise skillful and uh, that are kind not negative yeah why because often just the buddha's teachings by themselves are not enough to change us we need people around us who show us what is possible that show us other options of looking at life i'm just give, i just gave, gave you a talk about how to look at life and it's all it stays a bit theoretical but if you live with people who are generally positive uh, then you and it becomes more real much more real than my talk will ever be yeah uh, and you can be that person you can be that good friend this is this is a wonderful kind act of generosity that you can do not just for that single negative person but for everybody you meet in life this, this is a wonderful story the, the, by Tolstoy that Ajahn Brahm has adopted and I hope I tell it correctly but there some somebody comes to a king or something yeah I think to a king and they ask the king what is the most important thing to do what is the most important thing you know what is the most important thing to do what is the most important thing and what is the most important moment something like that I'm, I'm bastardizing it <laughs> because it's been a long time since I heard the story but basically they're asking what the most important moment then the king answers but most important moment is now what's the most important thing and the king answers most important thing is what is the person that's right in front of you or what is right in front of you but i think the original story says the person that is right in front of you what's the most important thing to do is the third question and the king answers the most important thing to do is to care So when you are with difficult people, they become to you the most important person in the world. And you care for them. This is how I try to try to live my life. And whenever I meet people, I try to, in different ways, care for them doesn't mean I'm always holding their hand or whatever. It's sometimes caring uh, takes more wisdom and uh, just means uh, situation dependent. Sometimes caring is just <laughs> is ignoring. <laughs> or at least that's how I sometimes see it. Sometimes people just want, want attention. Then the best thing is uh, just actually to sort of be, be a bit, uh, OK, OK, yeah, that's enough. Yeah, it sounds on the surface like you're not caring, but deeper inside you're caring. And with negative people, yeah, you can care in different ways and be there for them. And you will have to find your own situation dependent ways to, to open up your heart for them and have compassion. That's, I think, is the most important thing. Don't, don't respond to negativity with negativity. Respond to negativity with compassion and kindness says in the Dhammapada, never by hatred or anger is anger ever overcome. It's only through love and kindness that you can absolve hatred and anger. And then the Buddha says this is an eternal law. 
So it was true in the time of the Buddha. It's of course it's still true true now. You can't get negative persons out of the loop by your own negativity. You can only get them out through kindness. And it takes patience and endurance, but always keep coming back with a good attitude, kindness, and give them time to uh, find their own way out of their their suffering. That's how I would. That's how I would approach it as a first, first uh, line of approach. Anyway, you can use in so many different ways in life. Hope that uh, hope that answers your question. Sorry, I didn't get to the police uh, thing question because uh, I feel it's a bit uh, outside of my comfort zone, I, or I, at least I don't understand it well enough. So unless you can clarify that for me, then uh, I will just leave that question. All right, thank you, Bhante. The person who uh, mentioned about the police has uh, actually clarified um, how to deal with society as a bully. I guess it's when if you're living in, you've, you've talked about dealing with an individual person who may be very negative and causing you problems, but this person um, is living in a society that is very maybe oppressive and difficult. Um, is there a different um, advice or thoughts on that situation, Bhante? Mm, well, first I want to acknowledge that it, this is uh, this happens in life that some people are put in positions where they are uh, not treated equally. They are, as you, the question of things that bullied or you can be oppressed. So the first thing to do, I talked to before in the beginning of the talk, I talked about when I talked about good and bad, I didn't say there was no bad. I said, we also have to look at the bad as well. But we do it with a positive mind. So when you are in an oppressed situation, First thing is to not, I would say, to not to pretend like it wasn't there in a sense. Sometimes when we are suffering, the first thing we do is like uh, wish it wasn't there and just try to say, oh, it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, But the attitude, it shouldn't be that way never resolves anything so instead we have the first attitude we have is okay this is the situation i mean and you look at the suffering as it is and you don't try to ignore parts of it so that's my first thing i would say to you yes you you may be in that situation so how now to to deal with it I can only give you very general tips because, first of all, uh, I don't know uh, too much details, but uh, also I only have my own life experience. Yeah? I've been relatively fortunate not to be uh, oppressed much. I was a little bit bullied at school, actually, when I was a young boy. So I can relate to it in that sense. And what helped me through the bullying at school was having uh, also at least a few good friends. Maybe I, I was, a, was one of the brightest students in the class and I often, I don't know if this is the case here in Australia, but in the Netherlands, the brightest students sort of get, get uh, people get jealous of them. Kids get jealous of the brighter kids and then their response is to bully them. So I got sometimes bullied. But I also had a couple of good friends as well. So maybe the general atmosphere of the class, maybe jealousy and uh, bullying. But I knew always there were a couple of guys that I could rely on. And also, I had myself also to rely on. Because I knew I was not 
worthy of bullying. I didn't do anything bad by having good grades. <laughs> I mean, that was the point of school, isn't it? So if people get jealous and bully you, that's all there. And the problem is nothing to do with me. Yeah, I didn't do anything bad. So I knew that and I often had to reinforce that in myself and remind myself of it. Yeah, okay, it's, it's really a, a them, it's not me. Yeah, so the, do that as well. If you are uh, in a situation of oppression, it's never about you. You, you don't cause this. The other people who caused it. So you yourself inside can have still strong heart, confidence within yourself. This is society's issue more than yours. Yeah. So like in, in school, this was their problem, not mine really, in a way. Of course, it was all, if they bully me, it's also a bit of my problem. But they had the worst problem because they had the attitude to, uh, to bully me. And that is, uh, that, is, that, that is the real, the negative thing. That is really harmful to, if you have that kind of a mindset of oppression that leads to you to real bad places and the, the, the person who is oppressed suffers but the oppressor will eventually suffer more yeah so that's the way and also the good friends yeah if, if you have the opportunity to find some people around you maybe reach out to the bsw way or maybe you have close family and just see if you can create a more connection yeah, with them and maybe share your feeling of oppression with them and not in the way that you come close together and push society out as a result now just you come close together and then society okay can still be the way it is like me with my friends yeah they in in a, in a primary school they really supportive <laughs> and at one point actually really funny one <laughs> This was a friend of mine called Bill. Uh, he was a pretty strong kid and he was cool. He was like, he did all the rescue uh, swimming. He was a, he was a lifeguard uh, later on in life. Uh, not, not in primary school yet, but he was already into swimming. And one time, one of, the, one of those bullies was bullying me on the school uh, yard. <laughs> and then Bill <laughs> comes over and literally picks him up and throws him over the fence. <laughs> Oh, Bill, thank you for that. See, sometimes you just need other people to help you. Can't, can't place everything in life by yourself. Always. Yeah, so find some people. Find a group to uh, help you out. Kali and Amit are the good friends. The Buddhist said necessary. It's not not optional so that's why it's unfortunate when we can uh, have the internet nowadays share thoughts with each other and i would also encourage people to uh, get into contact with each other somehow through the bswa and uh, especially during the time of the lockdown reach out to each other some some way or the other i don't have social media and all but you guys you guys and girls and all you will probably have that so somehow BSWA probably has a Facebook or whatever. Reach out there, get close to each other, start a, your own Zoom groups or whatever you can do to help uh, support each other through uh, these kind of situations. Uh, yeah, that's my advice. And, uh, but the most important thing of that advice I would feel is trust your own, own worthiness. You are not worthy of being oppressed. You are a beautiful person inside. Hmm. Yeah. I hope that answers, answers it. <laughs> or, well, it's not an answer to the whole question, but at least it, I hope it gives you a start. Yeah. Thank you, Bante.
Um, I'll just point out, I think you're, you're very used to saying BSWA, but uh, oh, also yeah. that can oh, reach yeah, out to the BSV, the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Either, yeah. say, either place will maybe be a good place of support. Yes, sorry, everybody. I am <laughs> usually live in the Buddhist Society of w WA. That's why I spent seven years, and now I am here spending a range retreat with the Buddhist Society of Victoria, the BSV. So in my head, I'm still... Uh, Half of me is still in WA, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely fine, Bante. Thank you. Um, if we have reached 10.30. There is one more question that hasn't been answered. Do you have a few minutes more, Bante? Uh, I'll, I'll answer a one-liner. One -liner. All right. So uh, the question is, I have developed a fear of ghosts lately, so much so that it is affecting my sleep. Before I started doing meditation, such things didn't bother me nor did I believe in them. Any advice? Oh, I said I was going to do a one-liner. <laughs> Ghosts mm. also used to be people, and people don't generally want to harm people. If ghosts are around you, they are usually, well, I would say, Always, they are like people who actually want to be close to you out of uh, affection. Usually, ghosts are people who were close to us in the past. For example, uh, people, their partner dies, and then often they will, will see the, their partner later as a ghost because the partners stick around. They like to be around. So don't be afraid of ghosts. They have your... Uh, uh, they have your welfare in mind, actually. Yeah. Also, ghosts can't harm you. Because... Uh, Especially Yeah, maybe I'm I'm getting too 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 far into details now already. But just let ghosts don't harm you. Let it, let it be that the answer. Yeah. So ghosts they 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 are, they are not out to get you. That's the one line. They are not out to get you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Bante. Um we have uh run out of time for today but i want to thank you again so much for the talk and for providing providing all those answers bante um we look forward to hearing from you again tomorrow night for the guided meditation in the meantime hope you enjoy your your lunch <laughs> if there is one <laughs> if there is one <laughs> there will be i'm pretty sure i'm sure thank you everybody for listening and thank you london for organizing and thank you bsv for uh, making this uh, possible <laughs>